I've prepared some notes for you on John's Gospel and the raising of Lazarus, which was the reading of the fifth Sunday of Lent. John's Gospel is fundamentally different from the other three, the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those three are seen through the same eyes. That's what synoptic means, same eyes. You put Mark's Gospel in the middle and Matthew on, and Luke on either side, and you can underline the sections that are exactly the same word for word. And Matthew's own audience and Luke's own audience, they follow one another. John doesn't have those same eyes. He is certainly gospel. He clearly presents the good news about Jesus Christ, but he does so differently. John's gospel is different from the beginning, the prologue, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. The composition of John's gospel is the prologue, the beginning, the introduction. You might want to think of that as a overture to the symphony. You know, I was taught that in priest school, and I thought I'd pass it on to you. Then there's the book of signs, chapter 1, verse 19, to chapter 12, verse 50. It's the public ministry of Jesus, where Jesus reveals himself only to be rejected. And there are seven signs, the wedding feast in Cana, the healing of the official's son in Cana, the healing of the paralytic on the Sabbath, the multiplication of loaves, Jesus walking on water, the healing of the man born blind, and the raising of Lazarus. The miracles, all of them are signs. Their significance points to the presence of the kingdom of God revealed in Jesus Christ. That's what makes them gospel. And then there's the book of glory. That's chapters 13 to 20. It's in this glory that Jesus reveals himself and his hour. Himself, his hour, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension. And there's the conclusion, and then the epilogue, which is also an appendix. It's something added a bit later. John's writing is later than the other three. It dated somewhere between 90 and 100. Where? Uncertain. Uh, most scholars think uh, Ephesus, but that's a best guess. It has gone through a few editions, clustering together several episodes that fit together. The author of the gospel is, of course, John the Evangelist. But who was he? Well, we don't know. It's best said that the authorship belongs to the Johannine school or the Johannine community, a group of disciples of the beloved disciple. Suffice it to say, until contested, that the fourth gospel is complex, and it was composed in stages by the community of the beloved disciple. The direction of John's gospel is clear from the prologue with the use of the word, the word. The word is God's revelation. When you see or read the word, understand revelation. Humans reveal themselves to one another, and that's the way we get to know each other. It's also the way that God revealed himself through his own self-revelation in word and speech, action and deed through Jesus Christ. You'll read this in the beginning of the writing of John's Gospel. And at the conclusion of the writing, you'll read an ending, an appendix. One repeats itself after the other. Though the two endings are the same, really. This has been written so that you, dear reader, will believe and have life in Jesus' name. The word, the Logos, is Jesus Christ, the Son, the only begotten Son, who sits at the Father's side and reveals himself to those who are open to light and truth. Jesus is always the one who is sent. I seek not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me, 
we read in chapter 5, verse 30. That's a pretty good example. Conclude that the Father sent Jesus into the world as his living presence. Jesus is God's revelation, God's interpreter. Being God himself, he makes God immediately available, revealed clearly to the reader who becomes a believer. Read the gospel with that intention. The raising of Lazarus, that's John chapter 11, verse 1 to 53, is the last of the signs. It is a sign because as signs do, this lesson points away from itself to another reality, the reality being Jesus' own death and resurrection. Verse 4 indicates that this illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Further, happening as it does, near the Feast of Passover, it gives the Sanhedrin a good reason to nab Jesus. Thus, it serves as a transition from the Book of Signs to the Book of Glory. I hope you remember it from the Gospel on the fifth Sunday of Lent. In reading this, Martin Luther King Jr. might come to mind. Just before his assassination, he identified his mission and indicated personal violence would come his way. Also, his advisors tried to change his course, not to go to Memphis, but he didn't heed their advice. Take time and read the passage, the raising of Lazarus, John chapter 11, verses 1 to 53. Read the passage in voices, if possible, as if you're reading the script of a drama or some play. There's Martha and Mary, Jesus, the disciples, the Jews, and a narrator. The scene itself requires a tomb. The choreography of the characters is moving toward the tomb. As you read hear the words that you may believe. Let's go to die with him. Your brother will rise. I am the resurrection and the life. Come and see. Live and believe and never die. Where, you, where have you laid him? Think of light and day darkness and night. Martha and Mary are familiar. You recall them from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, when Jesus visited them for dinner. Martha is the dominant one, the busy one, who's upset. Mary is the one who's postured at the feet of Jesus. And they don't change in John's scene either. Martha is the first to encounter Jesus. Mary is more at the Lord's feet. This time, she speaks what she believes. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then there's an interesting question about the character Lazarus. Why wasn't he mentioned in the Martha and Mary lesson? as being the brother of Martha and Mary. Interestingly enough, Lazarus means God helps. But I don't know what we would do with that either. The Jews are a mixed lot. There is a question among them about the identity of Jesus. They are becoming aware that he's no ordinary man. Do you feel the love that Jesus has for Lazarus? Do you feel Jesus being perturbed, perturbed, greatly disturbed, bitter disappointment, perhaps angry, angry over death? Is Lazarus, whom Jesus loved, the beloved disciple, who most likely not, 
Read it here as a parenthetical comment, not as a description. Really, I don't know who the beloved disciple is either. Quite doubtful, but it did make you think, didn't it? And if you think about this sidetrack too long, you're going to miss the point, because here's the point. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. For all who, like Martha, believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. Chapter 11, verse 27. And this is a confession of faith. Martha's confession of faith. I believe, credo, the one who has faith, even after earthly death, will live. Thus the sign of Lazarus. Read over to chapter 20, with chapter 11 in one hand, 20 on the other. The mourning, the sorrow of Mary at the tomb, chapter 11, verse 31. Compare that with 20, verse 11. The tomb is closed, it's sealed with a rock or a stone. 1138, compare with 20, verse 1. The clothing in the grave, 1144, compare with 20, verses 6 and 7. And the role of Thomas, 1116, and 20, 24 to 28. Clearly, the lesson of Lazarus points to, as a sign that it is, the resurrection of Jesus. Read chapter 11 and then read chapter 20. You might have thought of this question. Why didn't Jesus prevent the death of Lazarus? Well, that's our human question. Jesus' divine response is different. Secondly, John looked back after Jesus' resurrection happened and proclaims it as another way that Jesus revealed himself, and John taught it as such, the good news of the kingdom of God. This is one way of opening the eyes of believers that we too will believe and have life in Jesus' name. The ones whom Jesus loves, those are his disciples who believe and have life in abundance, life that cannot come to an end. Jesus is now ready for the hour. At this hour, did you come to believe? Are you ready? What's holding you back? Can you relieve, relieve yourself from that tension? Can you release yourself from the tether? Is death still an enemy? Nifty questions, those. Reflect on them. God bless.